Have you heard the story of the boy on the bench? There was a boy about eight or nine years old who was sitting on a park bench one day with an open Bible in his lap. And this little boy is just hooping and hollering and praise to Jesus. He's saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, God is great. Well, there was a sophomore college student sitting across the park who picked up on this and was like really curious, why is this boy so happy? And so he approaches the boy and says, hey, little buddy, what's gotten you so excited that you're cheering about this? And the boy says, don't you have any idea what my God can do? I just read in Exodus how God opened the big red sea so that the entire nation of Israel could walk straight through the middle. Well, the college student scoffed. He said, you believe all that miracle nonsense? Don't you know there's no such thing as miracles in the Bible? And don't you know that modern scholarship has proven to us that at that time, at that place, the Red Sea was only 10 inches deep? It was no problem for the Israelites to just wade straight through. The boy hearing that was just stunned. And he slumps a little bit in the bench. His eyes fall to his open Bible in his lap. And he's silent. And the college student's feeling really nice and smug now, right? And so he's kind of puffed up and he walks away from the little boy. And he doesn't hardly get two steps before the boy continues shouting in praise to Jesus, God is great, hallelujah! And now he's a little bit frustrated. This college student whips back around and he says, what, what, what are you going on about now? And the boy says, don't you know how great my God is? Not only could he make a way for the entire nation of Israel to walk straight through the Middle Sea, the Red Sea, but now he drowned the entire Egyptian army in just 10 inches of water. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> oh, that we would have that kind of childlike faith, amen? Oh, that we would have a faith that moves from intellectual affirmation to soul-enraptured adoration. Because your faith is useless knowledge until it moves you to devotion, affection, and proclamation of God's greatness. Our problem is that we don't worship like that because our faith is misplaced. The problem, believer, is that because our faith is misplaced, we worship unworthy gods. We believe that more stuff will satisfy us, and so we worship money and the next promotion. We believe that the life is all about my comfort, and so we chase after the next vacation or the bigger house. This week, we're gonna be tempted to place our faith in political candidates, and so we idolize mere humans who could never save us. Time after time, we set our affections on worthless idols because we have forgotten who our praiseworthy God is, the one whom the you singers have been singing about so wonderfully this morning. So what are we to do? We are to not worship unworthy idols, but praise Yahweh. This is why the psalmist begins by issuing a call to praise here in Psalm 135, because he's reorienting our gaze to the sovereign God of heaven, the only one who deserves our worship and praise. And so hopefully you find your place now. We'll begin reading in Psalm 135. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. First, I'd like you to see that the psalmist calls you to worship. It's calling you to worship. This, in Hebrew, the first phrase that's translated in this translation as praise the Lord is literally hallelujah. Hallelujah comes from two Hebrew words, hallel, bless, and yah, Yahweh. So hallelujah literally means bless Yahweh, praise Yahweh, because he is the one who deserves true worship. He is the who of worship. We don't worship ourselves, we don't worship other people, we don't worship inanimate objects. Who should we worship? Yahweh. You'd notice here though that the word Yahweh, in this translation at least, is never used. It's Lord. Lord is the name that is used 18 times in this psalm. You see it in verse one, two, three, four, five, six, 13, 14, 19, 20, and 21. And did you notice that that Lord is capitalized? All caps, L-O-R-D. What is that indicating? It's indicating the proper name of God. This is how he has revealed himself in this psalm, and it is, as you see on the screen, Yahweh. Anytime you see the Lord capitalized throughout scripture, it's indicating his covenant name, his proper name, Yahweh. And so you're sitting there thinking, that's great. Next time I play Bible trivia, I'll know that, but why does that matter? So what? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
because names in the Bible represent your character or reputation. They signify where you came from or what you are like. And so, for example, after encountering God, Abram's name was changed from Abram to Abraham, signifying father of a multitude. Moses, his name means drawn from the water. Remember that? Moses, drawn from the water because he was pulled out of the river. Joshua means God saves. He delivers. Jeriel, 1 Chronicles 7-2, your life verse, I'm sure, means God sees. And that's why I could never get away with anything as a child. So what then does Yahweh mean? Save your spot here and go to Exodus 6. Save a spot in Psalm 135 really quickly. We'll pop over to the book of Exodus chapter 6. In the previous chapter, Exodus 5, Moses and Aaron approach Pharaoh and urge him to let the people of Israel go so that they may worship God in the wilderness, remember? Pharaoh not only refuses their request, but he actually intensifies his abuse and persecution of God's people. Well, if you're Moses, what does that lead you to do? In Exodus 5, it leads Moses to extreme discouragement. And he comes before God in faith and praise? No, the exact opposite. He comes in faithlessness and fear and skepticism. And so at the end of Exodus 5, look at verse 22. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought evil upon this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Watch this. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Wow. That is bold language before the king of kings and lord of lords. Can you feel the weight of discouragement that Moses is under? Moses is far from praising God. He can't sing hallelujah. He's actually accusing God, saying, God, why haven't you kept your promises? Have you ever asked God that question? God, why don't you keep your promises to me? It's easy to praise God when you get an extra hour of sleep. It's easy to praise God when things are going smoothly in life. But have you been tempted to believe that because life is really difficult right now, I get to be exempt from praising God? Have you been tempted to believe that recently? And God confronts this wrong thinking by reminding Moses that you're not expected to trust the Lord only when life is going smoothly. See what God says now in Exodus 6, verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And God spoke unto Moses and said unto him, Catch this, I am the Lord, all caps, Yahweh, And I appeared unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by the name of, a different name, God Almighty. That's El Shaddai. But by my name, Jehovah, all caps, Yahweh, was I not known to them. You see, this is incredible, friend, because amid discouragement and amid temptation to not praise and trust the Lord, what does God do? He doesn't do what you think he should do. He doesn't strike Pharaoh dead instantly. He doesn't immediately change the situation of the Israelites, and all of a sudden they're free. He doesn't do that. What does he do? He reminds his people who he is. He actually responds to that accusation by telling Moses his name. Yahweh. Incredible. Jerry, you still haven't answered the question. Why does the name Yahweh matter? It's because Yahweh signifies God's covenant-keeping faithfulness. It's because Yahweh, when you speak that name, you speak a reminder that God keeps his promises. Yahweh is the God who met Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, and at that divine encounter, he reveals himself as I am, all caps, Yahweh. He is the self-existent, self-sufficient one who is the eternal God who was and is and is to come. That is who our God is. Yahweh is not frail like us. He doesn't need to eat or sleep. He never gets sick. He's never going to retire. He will never die. Yahweh is. And he always will be. Think about that. Really think about that. Yahweh is. He just is. And always will be. That's why he deserves our worship. There's no one like him. No human, no other God. He is the self-sufficient, self-existent one. And so how are we to worship this God? What does he expect from us? Verse 3. Praise the Lord. Praise means to declare greatness. It conveys the idea of cheering or shouting or clapping. And so a few weeks ago, Jalen and I played in a football fundraiser, 
and they must have heard about my athletic prowess from my Jude series. It must have been why they asked me to be in it. Definitely not. And they, uh, Jalen and I were both on Team Blue, so you see us there uh, in our blue, and we were getting wrecked on Team Crockett, quite frankly. And we, uh, we, we like hobbled to halftime, and we are just zero points on the board, and it was very embarrassing. And Patrick McGarry actually gives our halftime speech, and he's rousing us, and we hit the field all motivated. We run the play, complete the pass, and touchdown. And before I even knew what was happening, I'm on my feet cheering as loud as I can. My hands are shot up into the air with a little bit of Baptocostal praise, and I am just absolutely praising. What is praise? It's to boast. In that case, we were still boasting that Team Crockett was in it to win it. That's what praise is. It's to celebrate, to boast in someone or someone's work. And what better method is there to praise than enthusiastic, spirit-filled, joyful singing? Look at the rest of verse 3. Sing praises unto his name, for it is pleasant. Did you know that singing is not just something that Christians do to fill service time? or prepare our hearts for the morning message. Singing is not just something we do so we can invite the you singers to present wonderful music that edifies our souls. Singing is not just something we do to give the musical people in church an outlet for their creativity, no. Singing is an essential feature in the praise of Yahweh. That's why we sing. And there are over 400 references to singing in the scriptures. Approximately 50 direct commands, commands, not options, For believers to sing, singing for the Christian is as optional as showing up to jury duty is. But unlike jury duty, it's not just our duty, it's our delight. It's our delight. Because true believers will sing, and they will sing with enthusiasm because God is worth boasting of. One reason we sing is because our hearts have been so moved, so transformed by the character of our God, Yahweh, that we can't help but roar with praise, declaring the greatness of our God. And so I have a question for you, believer. Do you actively engage in congregational singing? I'll ask it again. Do you actively engage in congregational singing? We're commanded. Or is it a habit of yours to stand silently and sternly in the pew, week after week, never cracking a smile, because God forbid you be happy in church, If we're compelled to jump and cheer for our favorite sports team and we stuff our hands in our pockets and slump in the pew when it comes time for singing, I think there could be something wrong with that. Or maybe if you're compelled to give a standing ovation in the concert hall, but you're hardly able to stand and sing in church, if you're able-bodied to do that with all of your heart, I think there's a problem of the heart there. Church, don't miss out on the duty and delight of congregational singing because it is one of the primary God-appointed methods that we are to use in our praise. So participate. Those first two verses answer one question, the call to worship. And the remaining verses, which we'll go through very quickly, is the causes for worship. Why does God deserve praise? Why does Yahweh deserve praise? We've already touched on a few of them, but In verse 3, it says, praise the Lord for the Lord is good. He's good. I won't belabor this point since Aaron Coffey just preached on this last week, and it was so effective in reminding us that our God is good. He is kind. He is compassionate. He does what is right, and he cares for his people. And God isn't only good. The rest of the verses will tell us that he's great, He is strong and kind, and there's two realms that God is sovereign over according to the Son. The first is, praise Yahweh because he is the all-powerful creator. You see that in verses 6 and 7. In verse 6, as our creator, the Bible teaches us that he has a supreme position. Look at verse 5. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. No one can oppose him. Picture the imagery here, if you will, of the Greek pantheon. You're familiar with all of that Greek mythology and all of these gods who are always clamoring. They're always fighting for preeminence. And in Greek mythology, you never know which god is going to come out on top, which god is going to win the day, which god is going to have the most followers and worshipers. But while there are many challengers to God's sovereignty, to his throne, there is only one conquering king, and it's Yahweh. 
Jesus always wins. He is above all because he created all. That's why he has the supreme position. He also has a supreme will. Verse 6, whatsoever the Lord pleased. Whatever God's desire is, that does he. In heaven, earth, the seas, and all deep places. This is a hard truth to grapple with. You mean to tell me that whatever God desires to do, it happens? Okay, what about when I get cancer? What about when I lose a loved one? Do you mean to tell me that that was God playing with my emotions, playing with my life's plan? This is a hard truth to grapple with. I'll give you that. But the truth is that our God commands all things because he created all things. He is our rightful owner. And as our owner, he has every right to do with us as, we please, as he pleases. He commands all things because he created all things. He's omnipotent. Who can stop his power? No one. Who can prevent his plans? No one. Not only is he omnipotent, he's omnipresent. There's no limit to his power or presence. You see there, he created all things in heaven, in earth, in the seas, in all deep places. If you think you can run from God's all-seeing eye or be beyond his reach of where his power is, you have deceived yourself. Because our God is all-powerful, he is all-present, because he possesses a supreme will. And then finally for this point, he, has, he is the supreme source of all life. Verse seven, he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightnings for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasure race. We just experienced the power of verse seven a couple weeks ago. God is in control of the Hellenes in life because he appoints the Hellenes in life. He appoints the storms. But there's more in this verse than that, and it's easy to miss the cultural significance of verse seven. See, in ancient Israel, there were numerous pagan gods. The one we're most familiar with is probably Baal. You heard of Baal in Sunday school, right? The prophets of Baal. And supposedly, Baal was viewed as the sustainer of life. He was the god of fertility. So he sustained crops and animals and people. You even see here some of that imagery with Baal holding a lightning bolt in that picture and holding wheat. That's how the pagans viewed him, that Baal was the sustainer of life. Baal was the creator. And so the question is, if Baal was the creator and sustainer of crops and animals and people, what was going on when Elijah shut up the heavens so that there was no rain in Israel for three and a half years? Well, that was a showdown between who's really powerful here? Who's in control here? Is it Yahweh, the one who keeps his promises, the creator God, or is it Baal? And in the end of that story, as you are probably familiar with, who had the power to form the clouds? Who had the power to send the rain? Was it Baal? No, it was Yahweh. The creator God is the only one who possesses that kind of power and authority. We may not bow down physically before a Baal idol anymore, but I want to ask you, how often do you and I worship the creation rather than the creator? How often do you and I worship the gifts rather than the giver. And it's my personal opinion that one of the reasons why technology is nearly inescapable in our society is because the tempter, our adversary, knows that the heavens declare the glory of God. And if he can limit our opportunities to interact with his artwork, he can limit our opportunities to give God glory. If he can keep us, for instance, glued to devices or cooped up in artificial environments, he can limit our opportunities to behold the grandeur and creative power of our mighty God. Friends, we live in one of the most beautiful areas of the country. I grew up in Houston. That's carcinogen coast. I mean, it's like nasty out there. If I try to hook up in my backyard at night, all I'd see is smog and plain taillights. It's, it's just, you don't see any nature. It's just concrete and big highways everywhere you look. But I go out into my neighborhood here, and I can actually see stars. During Helene, when we were all forced to unplug, right? I, I actually did go outside and I just looked up into the heavens. And I was reckoning with the fact that, wow, God is big. God is great. Every single star I see out there, millions of years away, God formed that? And, and I thought of the hymn, I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. And to be honest, I was so moved by God's creative handiwork for the first time in a very long time 
But I just stopped and prayed, God, you are so big. I am so small. Thank you for loving insignificant me. If the stars obey you, so must I. When was the last time you prayed something like that? Friends, there's moments of praise like this all around us, and we're entering into one of the most wonderful times to be out in nature. I'm seeing all of you morning siders post your hiking pics or uh, opportunities to enjoy the changing of the colors. And so let me ask you, very practically, when you drive the Blue Ridge Parkway, do you stop and praise God for that? Do you praise God for the beauty of the changing colors that reflects his beauty? As you hike to beautiful waterfalls this fall, do you stop and ponder the mighty God who gifted that to you? That's common grace, and all of it is to point to him. When you see creation, when you see Lake Jocassi, it should point your minds to Yahweh, the all-powerful creator. God deserves your praise because he is your creator, and then finally, God deserves your praise because he is the all-powerful savior. And this concept was introduced in verse four. Would you look back up to verse four? For the Lord has chosen Jacob unto himself and Israel for his peculiar treasure. God chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to be his people. Based on no inerrant merit or any good works, God elected a people unto salvation. And we talked about this at the beginning of our Jude series. We are the called, the loved, and the kept by God. And what's incredible to me about that is that in God's work of salvation, which he ordained from eternity past, The foundation of the world, that eternal plan of God to save sinners included you. It included me. And you can miss everything else this morning, but don't miss this truth. God loves you. God treasures you. And John 3.16 teaches us that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son to die the death that you and I deserved so that we could have eternal life. And so don't you think that a God that takes that much care to save his people, to have this incredible plan of redemption, deserves your praise? That's why the psalmist instructs us to praise him for his past acts of redemption. For the Israelites, that was at the exodus from Egypt in verses 8 and 9. The exodus is the Old Testament picture of redemption, of salvation. And think about it. God's people were oppressed and enslaved with no hope of freedom. So God sent a mediator to liberate his people from slavery. God then sent judgment upon sin that resulted in death. The only, pla- the only way that you could be saved from that death was for a spotless lamb's blood to be shed so that it could cover you. Does this sound familiar? Does it, do you see the parallels between the exodus and our salvation, when God did exactly all of those same things. So why does God deserve our praise? Because we've been liberated from spiritual bondage. The divine judgment has already been poured out on Jesus Christ, the perfect lamb. Hallelujah. But God's working doesn't stop at conversion. He's still working now, and that's why in this psalm, he moves from the exodus of Egypt to the conquest of Canaan in verses 10 through 13. And the conquest of Canaan is a picture of the victorious Christian life. Just like God granted triumph over pagan kings, God grants triumph to us as we obey his word and do his will. And and what's incredible is if you've walked with God for any length of time, verse 13 is true for you. Because you can look back on a life of battle where there were casualties and heartaches and yes, maybe even failures. But there are memorials that testify of God's grace working in your heart and in your life. And it's not that we live in the past, but when you remember those memorials, when you remember that victory over sin, when you remember when you chose God over that temptation and there is a monument erected of God's grace in your life, what are we to do? We are to praise him, give him the glory, boast in his grace. Don't miss this though, not only does he work in the past, not only is he working in the present, but he will work in the future. We work in the fu- he works in the future and we remember and bless him for his future acts of vindication. Verse 14, let's read that together. For the Lord will judge his people and he will repent himself concerning his servants. In other words, God will vindicate his people and comfort them in his time. 
There are times when God's comfort feels so distant because you are experiencing unbelievable heartache. On this side of eternity, we will suffer injustice. On this side of eternity, we will experience heartbreak. And in those dark moments, we need to cling to this promise in verse 14, that God will comfort his people. You push back. I don't feel that comfort. I still don't feel like praising God. I get it. I've been there. But in those moments, we must rehearse the truths of everything we've studied so far. God is still in control. God is still good. He has kept his promises in the past, and he will keep his promises in the future. And God will vindicate me. So what does that mean? It means that all the pains and injustices that I suffer in this life will be made right in the next. And that's a comfort to me because if I can't trust the sovereign God of creation and of salvation, what is my other alternative? It's in the feebleness of idols. Verse 15, if I'm not going to trust God, this is what my trust is in by default. Verse 15, the idols of the heathen are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Neither is there any breath in their mouths. See the contrast between Almighty God, Yahweh, and impotent idols. The mouth of God spoke, and the universe was formed. The mouth of idols was carved by men. It can never speak. Psalm 34, 15, our verse during this transition, God's eyes are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. And that's not the case for idols. The eyes of idols see nothing. Their ears will hear nothing. False gods are just feeble, cheap imitations of the one true God. And let me see if I can illustrate this. How many of you have ever tried to do a recreation picture? Anyone do recreation pictures in here? All right, I'm the only hand in the building, so I am definitely the weird one. But how many of you have, maybe, okay, let's try it here. How many of you have worked at or visited the Wilds Christian Camp? There we go. That feels, makes me feel a little bit better. Well, there is this ridiculous game that we play at the Wilds, if you've ever worked there, where you're in the fireplace room, and they flash this ridiculous scene on the screens, right? And your team is supposed to recreate that picture. And for some reason, my family, with no points and no peer pressure, still likes to play this game for some reason. And so this is my brother-in-law with uh, his three kids, and this is us recreating that picture. Yes, I'm that dramatic in real life. <laughs> this was a painting that hung in my mom's hospital. This is entitled Sisters by the Bay, and this is a piece I like to call Brothers in the Gray, okay? <laughs> And the last one, a recreation. But I should at least get points because I kept off the grass. We laugh at those pictures because they're, quite frankly, terrible. They're ridiculous. And you can see just how ridiculous they are. The cheap imitation of the true form. But I have a question for you. What if it's a lot harder to discern the inauthentic from the authentic, the real from the false, the true the good from the bad. And this was the case at um, the Needler Art Gallery. And uh, the Needler Art Gallery was this elite art gallery in New York City. And in 1846, it was founded, and it was very quickly the powerhouse of art galleries in the United States. I mean, this was the art gallery that gave the old master paintings to men like Cornelius Vanderbilt and J.P. Morgan. But through the centuries, Needler began to weather financial difficulties. And things seemed to be turning around at the turn of the millennium when their new president, Amy Friedman, acquired some new pieces that were supposedly painted by abstract expressionists like Jackson Pollock. But in reality, these pieces were forgeries. They were fakes. And they were painted by a Chinese immigrant living in Queens. I don't think that's Jackson Pollock. Between that 14-year period, between 1994 and 2008, the Needler Art Gallery sold 24 forgeries amounting to, wait for it, $60 million of art fraud. $60 million down the drain. Wasted. And entangled in controversy and costly lawsuits, the gallery shuttered its doors in disgrace in 2011. Why do I tell us that story? Because banking on counterfeits is costly. In the case of Needler, trusting in these forgeries led to their ruin. What's the parallel for us? 
you and I need to learn how to discern between true and false gods. And there is only one true God. There's more at stake than your reputation or even a few million dollars. If you get worship wrong, if you get praise wrong, you get everything wrong. Because if you boast in unworthy gods, you will be left empty-handed. And as we close, look at these final two points, the fate of idol worshipers. Not only are idols feeble, but those who follow them, verse 18, they that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. If you worship anything other than Yahweh, this verse is saying, you will be left spiritually blind like the idols, spiritually deaf like the idols, and ultimately ruined, spiritually dead because you become like what you worship. And we understand this principle. You are what you eat. You put junk in, you get junk out. What you love will shape your affections. You are what you worship. And I heard a preacher say it like this. If you have a man who is regularly attending church, he's singing the hymns, he's even serving faithfully at church, but with every passing month, he's getting angrier at home and more sullen and more given to fits of rage than you may depend upon it, he has a small carved idol hidden in a closet somewhere because you will become like what you worship. And how do you know that you're truly praising the God of the Bible then? Because I'm I'm trying to do all the right things and it still feels that way. Well, you will know that you are really praising God authentically if you do have eyes to see and you do have ears to hear and you're overflowing with abundant life as you drink from the eternal spring. Friends, you can fool me, you can fool the pastors, you can fool your Sunday school class, you can even fool your family, but you cannot deceive the all-sovereign, all-seeing, all-powerful eyes of Yahweh because he knows whether your praise is true. And in conclusion, if that is true, who can claim that they truly praise God perfectly? I better get out of this pulpit because I certainly don't. And I was just talking to a member over the weekend who was saying, Jerry, it is so frustrating in my flesh because I start out praising God purely and with good motivations to the best of my knowledge and somewhere along the way my motivations became twisted. And even in my praise and ministry, somewhere along the way, it became about me. Have you ever been tempted that way? I'm tempted that way every single Sunday. How can we make sure that we are truly praising God and it's by constantly doing what we just did today, reorienting our gaze. And so the psalmist ends as he began in verses 19 through 21 with yes, the cause, or excuse me, the call at the beginning, the causes, and now one final call to praise. He says in verses 19 through 21, bless the Lord, O house of Israel. Bless the Lord, O house of Aaron. Bless the Lord, O house of Levi, ye that fear the Lord. Bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. See, it's not too late to reorient your heart. You're not too far gone to repent of your false worship and turn your attention, affections, and desire back to Yahweh. He is waiting for you. He calls you to praise him. And so the question that remains is, will you choose to praise Yahweh? Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed. This is our time in the service where we want to reflect and make appropriate application in our own hearts and lives. And so we'll just give you a few seconds of silence to respond as God has you to respond. And then I'll close in prayer.